both as an athlete and as an entrepreneur, I think it's important to love that grind and to really be passionate during that whole part of it. Because if you're not passionate during that grind, you're never going to make it. This is Entrepreneurs The Playbook, where I give you access each week to the world's greatest athletes and executives about their personal and professional playbook and what has made them champions on and off the field. This is The Playbook. This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneur of the Playbook, and I am so excited, not just because I have two gold medals sitting in front of me, which is amazing, but I have Susan Francia, the two-time Olympic gold medal, three-time world champion U.S. rower. Ooh. Welcome to the playbook. Yeah, thank you. And you got the old school here. USA garb That's on. That's right. Well, I, Taking it back. What I like about rowing and other niche sports is that you don't grow up. I get kids that grow up dreaming about being on the dream team and playing Olympic basketball in the don't NBA. Don't we all? <laughs> right? And that's cool. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other sports out there uh, that are less, less well-known that still can provide true purpose, mm-hmm. education, character, all types of different things that I think through the non-popularity of the sport, meaning that endemic popularity, that we can actually learn more about ourselves how does one get involved in rowing? Yeah, so it's actually funny that you mentioned kind of those soft skills because rowing oftentimes is the like poster child, literally on the poster for teamwork. Um, so Which it seems is, to be very important. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Everyone's got to move together. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, I got my start in college. It is one of those sports that you can join later on and try later in life and what sports did you do before college um i sat on the bench for the basketball team i was really good at cheering for my teammates <laughs> nice i got a, a couple seconds of play but it really didn't go so well um i also tried high jump so i'm six two yeah you guys can't see me i'm sitting down <laughs> six two um but i was in all the like typical tall person sports and uh it just really wasn't i don't know as my coordination or hand-eye, you know, coordination or ball skills, whatever. It just didn't really click for me. But there's something in your personality. Too many people fail in life because they limit their point of entry. Mm-hmm. So I know so many people that would, at 6'2", would just stick to basketball or volleyball mm-hmm. or, like you said, the tall women's sports. Yeah. Um, and then never really explore saying, you know what? I, I may not be well-suited in this sport, but... I have certain skills, soft skills, as you mentioned, that may be attributed to other sports because I love athletics or I, you know, whatever it is. How did you kind of find uh, rowing as that soft spot for you? Um, so I went to Penn in Philadelphia. And now, I, I would uh, first, we have to stop there because I always have a chip on my shoulder. Most of my listeners already yeah. know this, but uh, I grew up with six kids. All, everyone but me went to the Ivy Leagues. Oh. So, in fact, I'm speaking. I told you to Penn <laughs> this week, and I always joke around that oh, they rejected me for undergrad and uh, law school, and oh. now uh, they pay me to speak there. So it's oh, my, my well, ultimate. You get the last exactly, laugh. except for I think my siblings still laugh at me. Oh. But I'm, I'm in deep respect of anyone, especially <laughs> nowadays. Being able, you were really on the rowing team, though, right? They didn't cut and paste your face onto the no, team. No, no, no. <laughs> Too I soon, really as you was. said. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's awesome. So you go yeah. to Penn, and yeah. So I got to Penn, and my first year, I just kind of, you know, like I said, I was sitting on the bench in high school. So why would I be? you know, a D1 varsity athlete. And I just figured I would focus on my academics. Um, Unfortunately, without sports, I kind of struggled. My like time management skills really weren't there. I kind of missed being part of a team. Um, And I actually ended up getting pretty bad grades. For Um, the first time in your life, I imagine. Yeah, (laughs) and so my parents were like, hey, what the heck? You need to figure something out. And so I literally looked through this booklet that had all of the sports listed. And one of the things that it said next to rowing was like, come try out. Like, you know, (laughs) anyone can try. I was like, oh, I'm anyone. Okay, cool. (laughs) And then they're like, especially if you're tall, like 5'8 plus encouraged. I was like, oh, I'm definitely 5'8 plus. Here we go. (laughs) I don't even make it on that list. (laughs) (laughs) So it was it was cool. I walked into the walk on meeting and people were like pointing at me like, you're going to be great. And I was like, oh, I love rowing. (laughs) It's great. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And so but I really did. um, I really did find that outlet for my competitiveness. I was always really competitive, even though, you know, I wasn't talented in other sports. Um, And I really loved it. I loved the camaraderie. I didn't love waking up in 
really freaking early. But, but that helped um, your grades. But it did help my grades, and I made the dean's list after I started rowing. So my parents were like, oh, you know, great, sure, enjoy right. this rowing. We don't know what it's all about, but great, you got better grades. That's all we care about. <laughs> right, they just like um, the dean's list. So then they were really surprised when I graduated, and I said, actually, I'm going to go do this. And uh, I'd had some coaches who encouraged me and said, hey, you could get to the Olympics. And I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Right and on. my parents were like, are you sure, honey? Like you got the spirit award in high school and for <laughs> athletics. Like really, you're gonna go, okay? All right, we support you. That's so, awesome. Yeah, it was it was really cool, and I mean now I don't even know where I would be without this sport. But which is amazing. Now, in the playbook of success, there's certain things you learn through rowing, mm -hmm. and you talked about teamwork, but that's a real general term. I run businesses, and teamwork's essential to my success you know yeah. i always actually put myself as a teammate or even allow others to be my bosses what are some of the things that you learn through rowing that most of us don't know the intricacies of rowing that really are attributed to teamwork and, and make you a successful teammate i think one of the biggest things is pushing yourself because when you're all lined up next to each other on the rowing machine and you see someone really kind of push themselves and you know you're all you're all in pain and everyone's like going to that well and then you're just like okay I hit that brick wall I'm gonna keep pushing to failure and kind of that journey together that is really what establishes trust and so when you're in the boat you trust that that person in front of you that person behind you is going to their absolute max and there's no question about that and I think that's one of the real big things about teamwork not just like, oh, we can get along, but it's like, no, I know that I'm working as hard as I can and so is everyone around me. And through that too, communication is really interesting when I look at rowing mm -hmm. because it's essential. You know, there's so many nuances of rowing that if you, there's no communication on the, it's not called a boat, what's it called again? Yeah, no, is it's it a boat. boat? Okay, yeah. cool, I thought there was some unique name. Um, but the communication, here you are all moving in synch mm -hmm. synchronicity or whatever, but how do you communicate on the boat? Um, so we actually don't communicate much, mm -hmm. actually. The person who is communicating is the coxswain, and she's the person who sits at the front of the boat, and she is the eyes and ears. And she is the one who says, you know, how the race is unfolding, whether we need to do a power 10, and really at that point, we're just listening and making sure that we're we're doing what she says. So the communication is- And she's important. not rowing at all. No, right. she's steering. That's but, it. Um, but the communication really is the off the water kind of stuff of like, you know, even just moving the boats around. And then, you know, when we're just friends and in our off time, that kind of communication is really is key. And I think respect plays a big big part in that but um but i think i think listening is the bigger part of communication mm -hmm. right which is i found interesting and in rolling mm -hmm. is that if one person hears something different lou holtz who is mm -hmm. the football coach at notre dame has this great saying it's not what i say it's what they hear mm -hmm. and if people are hearing something different that could be a disaster uh for your team now is there like in football the long snapper i always say people are so jealous there was a david bins for the san diego chargers made like $2 million a year. He was dating like some supermodel and he never got, there's rules you can't hit the long snapper mm -hmm. and he would be like jogging around the, is the coxswain in that position where everyone's kind of, cause it doesn't seem like you have to be in great shape to be a coxswain. Is that true? Um, well, so there's kind of a weight limit. So you have to be 110 pounds. Um, <laughs> so they're not six, six two. No, so they're not six <laughs> two. Um, but their, their role is just as important. Mm -hmm. So again, like it goes back to that respect thing. Like I know that I can't do that job and she yep. can't do our job, but at the end of the day, we all need each other. Excellent. Now yeah. to get from Penn to the Olympics, there's mm -hmm. a lot of sacrifice, uh, which in entrepreneurship, I always say is the misnomer or the missing piece that most people are dreaming of their passion, their purpose, and yet they haven't really thought through not making money, mm -hmm. giving every single thing that they have towards an ultimate goal, a personal goal, which then becomes a team goal. What types of sacrifices did you have to go through? Here you are. <laughs> Dean's List at an Ivy League school. I'm sure this wasn't the highest paying job offer that you had to try to make the Olympic team. 
Yeah, and that's that's so interesting, and I completely agree um, with that assessment because the part that's not glamorous, like no one ever sees that. No one ever, you know, all people see is, oh, on NBC, oh, yeah, you guys won the medal. Oh, that's, yeah, okay, that's the whatever 10-minute snapshot that you see, and they don't see the four years, the eight years before that. Um, Or the years after. Or the years (laughs) after. But honestly, I think both as an athlete and as an entrepreneur, I think it's important to love that grind and to really be passionate during that whole part of it. Because if you're not passionate during that grind, you're never going to make it. And the, the same thing with rowing. Like if you're not passionate about the training, the blisters, you know, like this is oh. what it looks like. And wow. it hurts. Yeah, that looks but like But you hurts. keep going <laughs> because you you love it and you have an end goal that like I'm going to make it. It's going to be me and it's going to be me and my teammates. One of the definitions of happiness that I came up with, I'm blessed to have the Olympic friends, uh, pretty famous ones and from Sugar Ray Leonard to mm-hmm. Apollo Ono. But they all have this enjoyment of the consistent every day, mm-hmm. persistent without quit pursuit of their potential and it really is the olympians come very very close to their potential when you work that hard for so many years you really get a feel for wow i'm really edging up to the best i can be uh which is an extraordinary feeling but you have to enjoy enjoy it what did you utilize as motivation to stay inspired to enjoy that because that's the in entrepreneurship mm-hmm. i've obviously had ups and downs and people say how do you stay mo- so motivated every day how did you stay so motivated yeah i would say there there are two things so for us as athletes like our coach our coach is the one who keeps us in check and when we think oh yeah i'm at that peak i'm this is good our coach is the one that says no that's you can do better not necessarily this is not good enough, but they always say, no, you can do better and you can always push more. And then I think the other thing is, and I think this is very relevant also in entrepreneurship, when you get those setbacks or when someone really just says, no, you're not going to make it. And I love, I love hearing that. Yeah, tell me that because I'm going to prove you wrong. And it's, it's the same thing as an athlete of, you know, when other people doubt you of saying like, okay. Yep, bring on that doubt. I I can't wait, you know, to be on that podium and show you that I was able to achieve this. And then there's another transition. You've won these gold medals, mm-hmm. and sooner or later, everyone gets old enough where they're not as good as they used to be. There's a biochemist chemistry about it. Um, my business partner is a Hall of Fame quarterback, mm-hmm. and I always have asked him. He played till he's 44 years old, which is oh, extraordinary. Wow. Uh, you know, started when he was 44 years old. But I asked him, you know, what, why don't you ever coach? Because I love to coach. Right? Mm-hmm. That's what I think makes me a great entrepreneur and leader in organizations is I'm probably a better coach than I was athlete. But some athletes can't coach. Yeah. Right? You know, yeah. And the worst thing you can do to a salesperson, a great salesperson, when they want to be in management, is take your best salesperson and make them an average manager. And now you've lost. Your yeah. Bet, right. And what, though, for you in the transition, because you, you are a great coach and you coach Thanks. at UCSD. Uh, and we have an inner, inner San Diego rivalry. Yeah. We have the San Diego Row Classic coming up, which is phenomenal. We have USD, San Diego State, yeah. UCSD. Some really, I think, good teams down there. What was it that in that transition was the most difficult thing from being an athlete mm-hmm. to now elevating others to elevate yourself? I think um, the biggest thing is that, like, sometimes I wish I could be in there for them, <laughs> you know? And even as a coach, like, you're just on the sideline. And you can't, like, all right you know, Susie and Sally get out of there like, all right, I'm going to do this. And it's really just conveying, you know, all of those things that you've learned as an athlete and then using that to to inspire others. One of the things, too, that I think is interesting, and I'm in the middle ages, right? I'm 51 years old. So I've the I'm both, ages. yeah, the, the, the both sides of the fence where it's I've seen for generations, everyone go in my day. Yeah. Right. You know how much harder people worked and and it's happened now generation after generation. And then you have this younger generation. I don't think, you know, on average, I, I think kids really work hard and, and they have different challenges and different backgrounds and different advantages. But when it comes down to, and I'm around a lot of different athletes, mm-hmm. when they step on the field, there's that same, they may be bigger, stronger, and faster nowadays, but, and, and the parents may be helicopter or bulldozer parents, but in the end, like I love the fire that I see in 
college, minor league, professional athletes. It's the exact same as I saw on my idols. You know, yeah. Bill Walton's down by you. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I was a ball boy for the San Diego Clippers when I was 12. And <sighs> all those guys playing, they look the same exact as now I sit on the Lakers sideline and go, these guys are all trying really, really hard. They're yeah. just a little bit bigger and stronger. I, I totally agree. And it's really fun. And actually, so one of the events that we're doing at the San Diego Crew Classic is we're bringing together all of the alumni and all of the current athletes and we're just mixing it up and i think it's so important for like the new athletes to see like hey you know what these old ladies you know we still got it um and then also of like the older generation to say like all right this is the crew that's going to tokyo and these are the guys representing us at the u.s you know for the u.s and and it's just gonna be a really um exciting event that we're gonna be that we're gonna be having and of course I got put you know in charge of doing all of this but it's been great to <laughs> just even reconnect with my teammates talk about sacrifice being in charge of the San Diego crew oh, classic yeah oh no no luckily I don't have to oh, be have in the, charge of the whole oh, just, thing oh, just, good. just the alumni that's version enough. which, oh, just is, the which alumni is enough part. for me right. <laughs> that's true sacrifice but yeah so it's gonna be on April 6th and 7th in San Diego so if you guys are no better place are down on there pick, come on out come come look at some and it's on uh, Mission Bay right yeah on Mission Bay yeah USA, which is one of the Nicest. USA USA versus USA one of the yeah. nicest places in America's last question though you know we have the gold medals here yep. um, being the world's best is extraordinary and there's a special feeling through all those years to be the world's best is there you know for me to be an American I love that the Olympics is every other year we have winter and then summer mm. instead of they both were every four years because I think as nationalism is challenged sometimes here, that there's nothing better at uniting our country than the Olympics. And for that to fall on your shoulders, and then for that to fall on your shoulders and perform at the highest level to win these medals, explain to everyone what that felt like to you to step up on the podium and win, and know that you unequivocally, for that moment, twice in your life, you were the world's best. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty amazing feeling. I mean, even when we're, you know, going through that grind, it's something that we think about that like that's yeah, I want to be up on that podium. Um, and the pressure, you know, I or actually our, our coach did a really good job of kind of keeping the media away from us because I know rowing's a smaller sport, but when we've now won multiple gold medals at the Olympics back to back to back. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, the U.S. women are probably going to bring home gold. And then all of a sudden we do get some media attention and it's good to just kind of keep it internal and remember what our goals are, not just as individuals, but also as like a boat, as a team. So the, the pressure really is just is an internal factor, I think. And what makes rowing, I think, like, I love speed skating mm -hmm. because, you know, like 0 .002 seconds can make a difference. <laughs> they joke around like first, second, third. Yeah. It's the same thing in rowing as well, right? Yeah, you can win it by, is. And and that's a lot of pressure. And for it's also years. crazy. I know because there can be like external things like wind or water or who knows. <laughs> yeah. But that's why you have to train even harder so it doesn't come down to that hundredth of a second that it comes down to a very clear margin. Hey, we won by boat length. Everyone saw that. How far know? did you win on these two goals? You um, almost the same amount, almost three seconds. Yeah, wow. So, so easy. And actually, the fun thing about rowing is we're going backwards, so you can see that you're up. Right. So That's the really whole time, cool. you're like, oh, we're winning. Like, oh, all right, don't screw this up, you know? <laughs> One of the few sports that they tell you, make sure you're looking behind you. <laughs> no, no, wait. You're, like, no, you well, still have to look forward. The, 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 right? <laughs> but, but it's yo, the backwards. Yes. That's awesome. Anyway, well, it's certainly a privilege and a pleasure to have you on the playbook. I know so many people are going to really gain some entrepreneurial playbook yeah, skills. I think so. And if you get a chance, make sure you make it to San Diego on April 6th and 7th to see yeah. the San Diego Crew Classic. Come see the, I'm whole, come the down. whole crew. I'm not going to run out my beach house that week. They're all going to Tokyo. Yeah, come I'm going to come down. see you, definitely. That'd come be awesome. see your future Olympians. There you go. Well, congratulations. Thanks for bringing the medals. We yeah. appreciate it, Susan. It's a pleasure. Susan Francia, Dave Meltzer, here with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.